We've all got those hard to reach places, and so have super yachts. There's the master windows, the sky lounge windows, and then what about the mast? Well, if we can't even reach these areas, what to do about keeping them all nice and shiny? Let's find out exactly how we do it. Work on a super yacht, move up through the ranks and maximise your potential. Hello and welcome back to Work on a Super Yacht. It's a little bit lumpy in here today, at one, one and a half metre waves outside the breakwater, so if you do hear those lines singing, please ignore them, but I'm hoping this new microphone setup's going to cut all of that out and all you're going to be able to hear is my voice. I am having a lot of fun with this new camera setup. For those of you who don't know, until now I've been doing everything on this phone, but now I've got this. All right then, I need to get out there and clean these sky lounge windows, so how hard can this be? Stop! What? No mate, you can't just, you can't just go climbing out over the side when no one knows about it and you're not wearing any safety gear. The same goes for you. What? And you. Oh man! No, I think we need to have a little chat in the office. Welcome to my office. I don't think I've shown you guys in here before. As you can see, it's quite nice. I've got a lovely big window with, at the moment, a lovely view. And I'm joined by Catherine, Stephen, James, and Daniel. They, they, they don't really have names. No, I, I know you, I know you have. I know you're called Catherine, really. I've been asked recently about what jobs I do on a day-to-day -day basis as an officer. Well, the clue's in the title. Officer. Office. I spend quite a lot of time in here dealing with the sorts of things that we're about to talk about. Although, at the moment, we're a deckhand down, which means I'm actually fulfilling the role of deckhand and officer. The sort of thing you'll have to get used to if you step up into a senior role on a smaller yacht. And what I'd like to introduce you to here is the Code of Safe Working Practices. This is basically the best practices for everything health and safety on board a ship. And it's not just for deck crew, it's also for engineering, interior, galley, indeed anyone who works on board a ship. Among the many chapters contained within, you will find managing occupational health and safety, safety induction, living on board, emergency drills and procedures, fire precautions, security on board, health surveillance, personal protective equipment. Hey, what do they mean to the Code of Safe Working Practices? Don't worry, Code of Safe Working Practices. He didn't mean it. Yes, I know it all sounds a little bit dull, but Trust me, there's actually some really good stuff in here, and you should find at least one copy on board every yacht that you work. One of the chapters that we're interested in here is Chapter 17, Work at Height, and the information contained in here is going to form the basis of a risk assessment and a standard operating procedure. So, what are the risks of just walking straight out there? Well, you could fall or maybe you could get crushed between this vessel and the vessel next door. Or you could grab hold of one of these big whip aerials while someone makes a transmission on the radio. They kick out some serious power and they can really seriously burn you. Now that we've identified some of the risks, we can start to write them up and detail the severity of each one, as in the harm that would be caused to a person, the environment or the yacht, and the likelihood of it happening. These two components, severity and likelihood, allow us to put each risk into a risk matrix, which allows us to rank them from very low through low, medium, high, all the way up to very high. A very low risk can be considered acceptable, but for anything above that, we try to apply some mitigating measures to help reduce the risk, either reduce the severity or the likelihood, or both. 
Any risk that cannot be reduced to at least a medium is not acceptable, and that job shall not be carried out. Let's take a look at some mitigating measures to explain what I mean. We identified there was a risk of somebody getting hurt by somebody making a transmission on the MFHF radio. So, we put signage on it to ensure that nobody uses the radio set. While we're at it, there are a few other things in here that need to be tagged out with signs like this. Let's think specifically about somebody up the mast. Any ideas? Well, for start off, there's that big blue thing, the radar scanner. You don't want somebody turning that on, not because it's going to fry you with microwaves, but rather because once it starts spinning, that's almost sure to knock you off your perch, possibly straight off the side of the yacht. And what about the horn or whistle? If somebody presses that while you're up the mast, not only could it deafen you, but it's going to give you the fright of your life, which could also cause you to fall off the side. We also said that there's a risk of getting crushed by the yacht next door, so we're going to want to check that there's enough space, and that if the weather were to pick up, that the two yachts are not going to start rolling and potentially come together. One last risk that we came up with was the risk of falling, so... We got some harnesses and climbing gear to keep us safe. We're going to be looking at exactly what to do with all this lot shortly, but before we do, let's just head back into the office to finish up with the paperwork. <laughs> yes, I know, Daniel. So, uh, so, yeah, so back in the office, and to be clear, we haven't identified all of the risks, or indeed all of the mitigating measures, but we've identified a few of them, and I hope that that gives you the idea of what we're trying to do here. Now we can draw up a standard operating procedure for each task. This is another officer favourite. I've got a whole book full of them here. And the standard operating procedure it should be something that can be given to anyone to help them understand, to instruct them on how to perform each task. How to go over the side to clean the master windows, or indeed the sky lounge windows. How to go up the mast safely to wash down or carry out maintenance. The standard operating procedure should include all of those mitigating measures, so make sure that you're wearing a harness. Tag out each piece of equipment that could be harmful, such as the radar, or the horn, or the radio. It should be clear then that the risk assessment and the standard operating procedure go hand in hand. The risk assessment identifies the risks and the mitigating measures, and then the standard operating procedure is a set of instructions specific to each yacht, that's very important, must be specific to each yacht, that shows how to carry out the task safely. When you join a yacht, these risk assessments and standard operating procedures should have already been carried out, probably by someone like me. And they should be given to you to read as part of your familiarisation and training for your job. You can almost think of them then as a set of instructions that you might receive with, for example, the purchase of a new camera. These instructions tell me how to get started, attach the strap, insert the battery pack, charge the battery pack. But when it comes to these tasks on board and your safety, there is one extra piece of the puzzle, one extra measure we take to ensure that everything is being done to the highest degree of safety. You may have heard of it already, and it's called a permit to work. Back to the Code of Safe Working Practices, or COSWAP, then, and you will find Chapter 14 is dedicated to permit to work systems. In short, the permit to work is a checklist which ensures that all of the instructions in the standard operating procedure are being followed. Unlike the standard operating procedure, which is always valid, I could hand it to you now, or I could hand it to you in six months, and it would be the same, save for any necessary updates or modifications that needed to be made. The permit to work, on the other hand, is specific to the day on which the job is being carried out. It's all very well telling me to insert the battery pack and charge the battery pack, but what if there's been a flood and there's water all over the desk? Would it be a good idea to start using electrical equipment? What about the state of the sockets? Are they in good shape? Or should they be checked and tested first? That's what the permit to work does. It asks us to check the weather, to check the surrounding area, to ensure that the person carrying out the work 
is competent and capable and has been shown how to do it, has been given the standard operating procedure and understands what they're supposed to be doing. Is all of the personal protective equipment, PPE, in good order? Yes? Tick. Have the horn, radio and radar been tagged out? Yes? Tick. And so it goes, all the way down the page. You'll also find other things such as the date, the location, where on the yacht is the work being carried out, who is doing it, who is the officer in charge, who is overall responsible for that job. Importantly, we must write on the permit to work how long it is valid for. Certainly no more than 24 hours, because of course in 24 hours time the situation outside could be completely different. So maybe today it's a good time to go out and wash the bridge deck sides. But what about tomorrow? Maybe tomorrow there's high winds forecast, or maybe a thunderstorm. If we decide that we want to go out on the bridge deck sides tomorrow, then a new permit to work will be drawn up and the checklist will be run through again. On this yacht it is an electronic document which is logged immediately with the management company, but it can also be done in paper form and in any event we can still print copies out, put them on the bridge, put them in the crew areas, put them at the location of where the work is being carried out, and that way everybody knows what's going on. As I said before, it may not sound very exciting, but it's all there for your safety. And if you wish to go on to do the Officer of the Watch qualification, you will have to learn all of this stuff as part of your Efficient Deckhand course, which, remember, must be taken at least 18 months prior to applying for your Certificate of Competency. Now that all of the paperwork has been taken care of, we can get out there and get on with the work. OK then, so here we are, back up on the bridge deck aft, getting ready to go out and clean those sky lounge windows. You'll notice that I've put a drop cloth down because, top tip, I'm full of them. If you drop things like these carabiners on the teak deck, they make a real mess of it. First things first then, and we've got the harness. Made by a brand called Petzl which is what you're likely to find on pretty much all yachts. I think every yacht I've worked on has used Petzl gear. It's really good. This isn't just leisure stuff. This is actually a professional kit that, for example, electricians might use to go up electricity pylons or to service lampposts, something like that. And it is a full body harness. Now, the standard operating procedure, the instructions, tells us to wear a harness. The permit to work asks us to ensure that the harness is in good order. All these webbing straps, they're really strong, but if they go mouldy, or maybe they are corroded by some sort of chemical reaction with a product that's being kept where they're being stored, they can break, maybe not just by you pulling on them, but if you were to fall and the force of that load coming on suddenly could break them the harness would fail and you may end up in the water. So we're going to give it a good visual check. Check all the buckles. Check that there's no rips, no tears, no strange discoloration. And if we're happy, we can put it on. Now these come in a couple of different sizes. Let's take my radio off first so I can get into it. It's quite simple, you just step in. Release the buckles enough that you can easily slide it on. And then you're going to want to pull the straps down nice and snugly. And that's the bottom half of the harness on. Then we can put the top half over. Make sure that there's no tangles. And now this is the important bit because so many people get this wrong. You're going to want to secure the harness using this carabiner. Most people think, well, I'll put it through that loop. However, in fact, you want to secure it through the webbing strap.
Notice also how it's got a little red marker on it. You're going to want to screw the gate down. You can no longer see the red marker, that means it is locked. Now the rest of the harness can be tightened up nice and snugly. All done. Next up, we're going to want to rig our fall arrest lines or safety ropes. Now, on some yachts, you'll find that these are already made up. They can be bought from Petzl, and some of the models even have the ability to lengthen and shorten the rope depending on what you need. Knowing how to set up and wear your gear properly is, of course, important because if you don't do it properly, if you do fall, there could be some serious problems. I was particularly fortunate working on one yacht, the 93 meter, because they sent me and the rest of the deck crew on a climbing course, a high access course, the sort of course that you might give again to an electrician who goes up electricity pylons or services lampposts. And that really gave me a good understanding of why we use the equipment in this way. Of course, not everyone will be sent on such a course. In fact, it's likely that you won't, but that yacht was so big and there were such vast areas that were inaccessible that we had to have a better understanding because we were actually abseiling down the side of the yacht and then needing to climb back up again. I think it can be fair to assume then that this is the sort of extra training you'll get if you work on a much larger yacht. Right then, that's that all sorted. What else do I need to be wearing? Well, the standard operating procedure tells me that I need to be wearing a life jacket, because if for whatever reason I do end up in the water, that's going to save me. Now, I'm not going to use one of the emergency life jackets that we have on board, because of course these are for emergencies only, but also because these are auto-inflate. I'm out there washing down, working with water. I don't want this thing going off automatically. So, Instead, we have these working life jackets. Manual inflate only. As ever, don't forget the crotch strap. And there we are, all secure. It's important that this is worn over the harness because of course, if you do need to inflate it, you want it to have room to inflate. If it's under the harness, there's a very good chance that it's actually gonna crush you. Right, all done, now I can go. Stop! What? Just hold on one moment because before you finally go out there, the officer in charge who is going to sign off on this permit needs to double check that you have indeed put everything on properly. Then, and only then, will the officer sign off on the permit to work, it will be validated and you'll be ready to go. Okay then, I'm all ready to go out on this bridge deck side, so I'll see you down at the office window. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. If you're happy and you know it, clap your hands. And that's it, the job complete. Now, any equipment that was used to complete the job must be put away properly. Once everybody is happy that the job is finished completely, then the permit to work can be signed and closed. Now I know that this may seem like a huge task just to go out on the British Tech sides. We've got to go through this whole process, but it's all there for your safety. And it's very easy to think, I'll just, I'll just nip out. I'll just pop up the mast just to grab something. We've all done it. I've done it. I know that you have probably done it somewhere along the line, on a yacht or not. But don't take any chances. Follow the procedures. They are there for your safety. And in any event, if you wish to work your way up the ranks, whether that's as a deck or engineering officer, or even as a head chef or chief stewardess, you need to know about this stuff because this stuff applies to you. So much better to have a good understanding of it now, right at the beginning, so that you can build on your knowledge as you go up and that when it comes to being tested, examined on this sort of information, 
you've already got a huge head start. As always, thank you so much for watching. A like would be fantastic. A sub would be amazing. And I very much look forward to seeing you next time. <laughs> well done, guys. That was just wonderful. You did a really great job. I've never seen you looking so green before. And James, just the way that you were photosynthesizing earlier on, that was just splendid. No, don't worry. The, the, camera's, the camera's not rolling anymore. Wait a, wait a minute.